beginner class with Miss Michelle and Miss Renee. First and second grade. Follow Miss Renee and Miss Michelle. Got a great group out tonight. So, Jason, are you ready? He's up there. You know, we've been, uh, this is the, the fourth week. If you've missed any of these Wednesday nights, you can go to YouTube or Facebook and just put down a River City Church AG, and they will come up on Wednesday night. So, we started our series September 1st, right? And today is the 22nd, so this is the fourth week. We have one more. And they have been challenging, provoking, in a good way. Because we are to provoke one another, right? But in a good way. To love and good works, okay? So we, you know, we just want to encourage each other and bless each other. And we just believe that God has great things for us. Amen? Who believes that? I believe it. You know, he's already done a lot of great things, but he's not done. Okay, he's got a bag full more of good stuff for us. Amen? And so, uh, so Jason, why don't you just come and just open up our hearts, open up our ears, just, just hear what God has for us. Okay. All right, well, praise God. Good evening. Wow, it seems like we multiplied tonight. Yeah. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. So tonight we're on part four of the faith series. You know, with each session, it seems like we're adding another dimension or another layer to our understanding of how to walk in faith. In week one, we learned that there's more to reality than what we can see, hear, touch, or taste. And we learned that we as believers need to be operating from the vantage point of total reality specifically with regards to the spiritual realm. When God speaks in his word, he's speaking from the vantage point of total reality, taking in, into consideration both this physical realm and the spiritual realm. The word of God, therefore, allows us to see directly into the spiritual realm and to know things that we can't know, that we can't discern with our physical senses. Well, that leads us to week two. And week two, we learned about how two famous figures in the Bible— uh, the Apostle Thomas and Abraham responded to the demand of the Word of God. Thomas was entirely bound by his natural senses and circumstances, and he was therefore cut off from that whole other half of reality, that whole other half of the picture which the Word of God reveals to us. Because Thomas wasn't willing to believe that anything existed other than what he could verify with his physical senses, he was misinformed as to what was actually true. Okay? And he was walking around completely oblivious to the glorious truth already prophesied by the word of God that Jesus was risen from the dead. What a tragedy. What a tragedy to be oblivious to the truth which only God's word can reveal. I wonder how many people have had God answer their prayers, release healing in their bodies, or supply them with provisions, and yet they're completely oblivious to it. They're completely oblivious to it because God's power is first released in the spiritual realm before it manifests in this natural realm. But most people just can't get themselves to believe a thing unless they can tangibly discern it with their senses. But that's not us, right? Amen? We're believers, right? We're believers. We believe God. We believe his word. And if the circumstances appear contrary to the word, we realize that, you know what? There's more to this story. Praise God, there's more to this story. There's the whole spiritual realm that needs to be taken into consideration. That's where God's power has already been released. That's where our needs have already been dealt with, okay? And that's where the word of God is actively working and bringing those things which exist in this spiritual realm into this physical realm. Hallelujah. But just like we saw in the, in the life of Abraham, the things which God gives us in his word can only manifest 
by faith. By faith. Abraham believed God's word over against the impossibility of his circumstances, and his faith allows God power, allows, allowed God's power to flow and for the Spirit of God to produce a miracle in his life that we're still talking about today. Isn't it amazing? You can cooperate with God by faith, and people will be talking about your story for years and years. Okay? That's the legacy of faith. Um, glory to God. Faith worked for Abraham, and faith still works for us today. Faith still works. It's still the path to victory. So finally, last week, we learned about the importance of having faith in two places, right? Do we remember that? Faith in our hearts and faith in our mouths. King David said, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. When we believe God's report, when we believe God's word on our hearts, then the next logical step is to open our mouths and speak. We speak the word of God. We speak life. We prophesy and call things that be not as though they were. We take our blood-bought authority in the all-powerful name of Jesus, and we command our circumstances to line up with the word of God on earth as it is in heaven. You know, it's amazing. Jesus showed us that his word has total mastery over all of creation, whether that was revealed by him calming storms, healing sick bodies, raising the dead, casting out demons, or providing miraculous provision. All of these things were accomplished by Jesus opening his mouth and speaking. And we, as heirs and co-heirs with the Lord Jesus, are called to do the very same thing. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So how is all this binding and loosing, how is all this releasing of the power of God going to happen? It happens when we speak the word of God in faith and give commands in the name of Jesus in faith. That's how we bind and that's how we loose. Faith speaks. Faith declares. Faith commands. And then faith walks on in total confidence that the word of God and the name of Jesus did its job. So that was all a little primer, a little review. And, you know, I like to review because we're building here. Every week we're building, right? Right. But now that brings us to our new lesson, right? So are you ready for the new thing tonight? Are you guys ready for, to learn something new? Okay, here it is. Faith looks to the past tense. I'll say that again. Faith looks to the past tense. It doesn't look to the future. That's hope. It doesn't even look at the things that are currently happening. That is in the present. Now, Faith is looking specifically at what God has already provided through his word and through the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you don't understand this concept, you can be spinning your wheels, spiritually speaking, for the entirety of your Christian life. Let's put it this way. You know, there are different spiritual positions, okay? James 4, 2 states, yet you do not have because you do not ask. When you bear this verse out, it's been said that what's actually being indicated here is that we don't see answers to our prayers because we haven't positioned ourselves to receive. Okay? We haven't positioned ourselves. It's just like your vehicle. There are different gears represented by different positions of the gear shift, which will put the vehicle into a forward mode, reverse mode, neutral mode, etc. I can't put the car in reverse and expect to go forward, right? That's how accident happens. accidents happen. How many have done that on the way to work? Before I know I did, right? Put the car in reverse, and you're, you know, you, uh, you're thinking you're going forward. It's, it's, you know, it's a recipe for an accident, right? Well, the same thing is true in the spirit. We need to make sure that we're in the proper spiritual position in order to receive from God. Now, that position is faith. And when we're truly in faith, we're looking back to the past of what God has already done. We put our salvation, our deliverance, our healing, or our answer uh, to whatever we've asked the Lord in the, past te pent, in the past tense, and then we treat it as a finished reality in our lives. In fact, faith is simply our response to that which God has already done. So let's think about salvation for a minute, okay? One time a Catholic lady said to me, well, you know what? I know that you're going to make it into heaven because you're good. But as for me, I'm going to keep praying and keep trying and keep hoping that I make it. 
Well, immediately I had to correct her understanding by letting her know, first of all, that my salvation had nothing to do with how good I am. I know me, <laughs> right? It has nothing to do with how good I am. And secondly, that you can't get saved just by hoping for it, just by hoping that in the end Jesus will receive you into his kingdom and all will be well. That's not how salvation works. To be saved, you have to get into agreement with God's word regarding what Jesus has already done for you and want to respond in faith to the truth of the finished work of Jesus and to his glorious resurrection, then the spirit of God comes to live inside of you and you become a new creation. That, that's how salvation works, right? And then you can say this, now I'm a child of God. Now I'm a new creation. Now I'm a blood-bought citizen of the kingdom. I'm not hoping to be saved. I'm not looking to the future in the hope of getting more saved or becoming more born again or becoming more of a child of God. I am saved, period. Jesus has saved me, past tense. It's in the past tense, and the eyes of my faith regarding salvation are looking back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I'm looking at the cross. I'm looking at the empty tomb. I'm looking back at Jesus' finished work, and I, as a new creation, live my life in light of what he has done for me and what he has made me as a result of his finished work. That's how salvation works. We're not believing that God is going to save us at some point in the future, and we're not hoping for our, our salvation at some future point in our lifetimes. Consider this. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he says, In an accepted time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Faith receives right now that which God has already provided for us. So instead of saying, oh, I sure hope that I get saved one day, we say, God has saved me. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And now that I'm a child of God, okay, because I simply have put my faith in what Jesus has done. That's saving faith. Hallelujah. That's how it works. Well, you know what, guys? It's the same way with healing, with deliverance, with answered prayer, or with anything else that God says he's given us in his word. We put his answer to our need in the past tense, and then by faith, we live our lives in response to the answer being an accomplished fact. Okay? As, our, as far as we're concerned, it's an accomplished fact. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You see, God, through his word and through the finished work of his son, has given us everything we need to live an abundant and victorious life. But we need to get into agreement with the reality that we do, in fact, possess these things now, and then we are to live our lives as such. 2 Peter 1, 3 declares, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. God already has, past tense, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the kingdom. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He's given us his authority to bind and loose. And he's given us all the power of the name of Jesus. He's given us all these things. God hasn't withheld anything from us. All the power of heaven has been released on our behalf and is at our disposal right now. But our job is to agree with God, to receive whatever we need from him as being an accomplished reality, a past tense fact, and then to walk on by faith in full possession of our answer. So do I wait until I see my healing with my eyes before I believe and speak the truth that I am healed? Do I live my life believing and speaking that someday in the future, God is going to heal me? Not at all. That's hope talking, not faith. 1 Peter 2.24 declares, by whose stripes you were, past tense, healed. So I get into my prayer closet, okay? This is how this looks. I get into my prayer closet, and I say, Father, your word shows me but that by the stripes that your son Jesus bore and because of that brutal beating that he endured, you have healed me. Your word says I was healed. 
if I was healed, then I am healed. And so I get in agreement with you right now, Father, and I receive what Jesus did for me. I thank you that your healing has now been released in my body, that the sickness has been cut off at the very root, that I am a healed person, and that my body is now manifesting that truth in Jesus' name. And then you know what I do? Then I walk on. I get up out of that prayer closet and I walk on, keeping my healing in the past tense, keeping my faith in the proper position and allowing the power of God to bring about the full manifestation of that which God has done in me. If someone comes up and says, oh, I can see you're very sick. I can look right at your body and see that. I'll pray and we'll hope that God will heal you. You know, you can tell them, the just don't live by hope. The just live by faith. The word of God says the just shall live by faith. I live by faith in the word of God, and his word says that by his stripes I was healed. So praise God, I am healed. Hallelujah. Feel free to give me an amen on that one. <laughs> I ain't hoping for nothing, okay? I know that's not proper English, but I just had to put that in there. I ain't hoping for anything. I'm looking back at the finished work of Jesus. I'm looking back at what God has already declared. And I'm living my life in light of the truth that God has, past tense, healed me. That which God has declared has now, by faith, become a present reality in my life. That's faith. That's the proper position we need to be in in order to receive from God. Hope won't get the job done. Faith will get the job done. So for a bit more understanding, let's take a, a look at the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that story, right? Everybody knows that story. The prophet Jonah had received the word of the Lord that he was to go to the city of Nineveh and condemn the wickedness of that city, presumably for the purpose of the people's repentance. Now, Jonah, he disobeyed God. He went down to Joppa, and he boarded a ship in order to flee from the presence of the Lord. You know, knucklehead actions will always have knucklehead consequences, right? And so Jonah was soon thrown overboard and swallowed whole by a whale. The Bible says that he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. I imagine it would, you know, it must look like an absolute nightmare on the inside of that fish. Well, sometimes when we face hard times, we get real with ourselves and we get real with God. And that's exactly what Jonah did in the belly of that whale. But I want you to pay careful attention to what he said in the belly of the whale. In other words, what he said in the middle of his problem, so to speak. Uh, Jonah 2, verses 1 through 6 state, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even in my soul. The deep clothes around me, around me. Weeds wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth was with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 9 and 10 continues, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed, salvation of, is of the Lord. In verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Wow. So Jonah made some terrible choices in his life, and because of those choices, he found himself in some real trouble, some life-threatening trouble. But amazingly, this man knew the path to redemption. He knew the path to deliverance. He understood faith. Okay, now notice he didn't just beg God and plead with him repeatedly to spare his life. Now, he was saying in, in his heart, oh, yes, I went down to the very depths of the earth. Oh, yes, I went into those dark regions of the netherworld uh, such as no man should ever go. But even there, you heard me, Lord. You heard me and you answered me here right now, right in the midst of my problem right in the midst of these hard circumstances, I count myself as delivered. I'm delivered. And now there's nothing left to do but to thank you, Lord, because I'm a delivered man. That's faith. That's faith. 
right there, right in the midst of his problem, right in the belly of that horrible beast, Jonah put his deliverance into the past tense. He put his deliverance in the past tense, and he started praising God that God had past tense delivered him. Mind you, he was still in the belly of the whale. But brothers and sisters, when you agree with God and put your answer in the past tense, the circumstances have no choice but to submit. Shortly thereafter, the, spit, the fish spit Jonah right out of his mouth, and Jonah saw with his physical eyes the deliverance which he had already seen with his heart. Faith looks at the past tense of the word of God. Faith counts the answer as done, complete, finished. Then the only acceptable response is to simply thank the Lord for what he has done. Okay? So consider this. You all remember the story of Joshua and his men and how they marched around the walls of Jericho, and then God made those walls fall down flat. I believe Falco uh, preached on this a few weeks back. Well, in Joshua 6.2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. You know, when the Lord said this, in the natural, those walls were still very much up, okay? Jericho was extremely well fortified and well protected, and all of its power structure, including its king and its army, was very much intact. But the Lord put Israel's victory in the past tense, and so did Joshua and his men. In their minds and hearts, Jericho was theirs. They had their victory, and as far as they were concerned, those walls were as good as down. Understand, too, that when uh, God told Joshua to see, it obviously wasn't with his physical eyes, right? Because from a physical standpoint, Jericho looked as mighty and as fortified as ever. No, the Lord was telling him to speak, to see with his spiritual eyes, okay? To see with his heart. And to see that from God's vantage point, the battle was already won. Victory was already assured. I'm talking about the past tense of faith. Well, how about this one? For good measure, let's do three. In Genesis 17, 5, before Abraham had his son Isaac, God said to him, you no longer shall be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. There was no child in sight, let alone a multitude of descendants. But for Abraham, the word of God was more than enough. God said that he had made him a father of many nations, and Abraham agreed with God and started calling himself a father of many nations. He put his victory in the past tense on the authority of the word of God. He believed God's word as a completed fact, okay, a completed reality, and his faith allowed the power of God to flow, and he saw the birth of his son Isaac. Faith merely responds to that which God has already done, and faith treats the answer as an accomplished reality. That's true faith. That's the proper position for faith. Well, you may be saying, okay, well, that was for those guys in the Old Testament. But do we still relate to God by the past tense reality of his word? Well, I think it's time for some scriptural rapid fire. As you guys are getting ready to know me, you know I love r scriptural rapid fire. So here we go. Now, remember, all these statements refer to you, the new covenant believer, Okay. In John 17, 22, Jesus said to his father, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Second Peter uh, 1, 3 through 5 says, um, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, virtue by which we have been given, um, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's all past tense. In Romans five five, the Bible declares, "Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us." Second Corinthians five eighteen. Uh, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. How about this one? Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what has he given us? A spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
In Ephesians 1, 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Colossians 1, 13 uh, and 14, he, had, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. First uh, John 2, 20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and know all things. Okay, here's some great ones to remember. Matthew 8, 17. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And finally, in uh, John 1, 16, the Bible states, and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. I'm going to take a drink of water after all that. That was a mouthful, huh? But y you get the point I'm making. You get the point I'm making that it's all in the past tense. Amen. That's right. We've already been blessed. We've already been healed. We've already been delivered. That's the report of the word of God. The past tense of God's word. He has past tense given us all those things. See, do you, do you see how in light of what we just read, uh, it's completely incorrect for any believer to just walk around grumbling through life and complaining, oh, I wish God would give me his presence. I wish God would just loose his anointing in me. I wish God would give me the power of, of his spirit in my life. I have nothing. I wish God that, that God would heal me, deliver me, or prosper me. I, I wish God would just do something. Have you heard people talk like this, right? The truth is, he's done a lot of things. In fact, he's done more than we can ever need. We just need to get into the word and find out what he's done and then get into agreement with that word as a past tense reality in our lives. When we do, we'll start talking like this. I am anointed by God. I do have the same power uh, that raised Jesus from the dead flowing on the inside of me. I am chosen, prepared by God, and equipped for the mission on wh for which he has sent me. I am loved by God. I am redeemed by his blood. I am healed by his stripes. I'm delivered from the power of darkness. I do have all the authority and power of the name of Jesus to accomplish his will on the earth. I am blessed. I am a child of God. You see the difference? You see, all of those statements are responses to the past tense declarations of the word of God. That is, to things which he says he has given us and which he says he has done for us. So that's how faith operates. That's how faith talks and acts and lives. But the, the truth is, brothers and sisters, probably around 99% of believers confuse faith with hope. Okay? They say things like, my breakthrough is coming. God will heal me someday. I'm going to get my deliverance. God is going to do something in my life. That's hope. It's looking ahead to the future. Okay? Now, to be sure, just to be clear, hope is from God. Okay? And hope does have its rightful place in our Christian walk. We hope for those things which are promised us in the future, and we hope for them with great joy. You know, I'm looking forward in hope to the glorious second coming of Jesus. Hallelujah. Every time I put on the news, uh, there's something inside of me that yearns more and more for that glorious day when those clouds open and here comes the king of glory. Hallelujah. That's our blessed hope. Amen. I'm looking forward in hope to the promise of spending eternity in paradise, basking in the glory of God Almighty. I'm looking forward in hope and by the promise of God to being wonderfully reunited with all those loved ones who knew Jesus and who went ahead before me into glory. That's hope. That's hope. It's real, and it's a blessed hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need hope to give us proper perspective in life and to give us the ability to press forward, energized by a confident expectation of the goodness of God. So we need hope. But that having been said, I can't operate in hope and expect the results that only faith can give. Let me say that again. I can't operate in hope and expect the results that only faith can give. When I was younger in the Lord, um, I very much confused faith with hope, okay? Now, I went about doing and saying all the right things according to faith teaching, but if you really examine what I believed, you would see that I was in hope, not faith. For example, I understood that in order for my 
healing to manifest, I had to quote the word. I had to confess my healing. I had to act like I was healed. I had to do all the things that a healed person would do. I understood that, and I did all those things. But in my heart, I was still regarding my healing as a future tense event. And therefore, if you really boiled everything down, I was actually trying to use my faith words and actions to inspire God to release the healing power that I needed in my life. Okay? Now, I wasn't actively aware that I was doing this. I thought I was in faith. But truthfully, I was in hope. And there's a real difference between the two. But you know what? The difference between the two can be very subtle, almost, uh, upon observation, indistinguishable. So with that in mind, I believe that the Lord gave me a, uh, a useful illustration to help us uh, kind of put these things into perspective. So bear with me for a minute. I'm going to give you two scenarios side by side, and I want you to pay attention to how the actions in both scenarios are identical. The attitudes and positions of the heart, however, are very different. So here it is. Are we ready? Scenario number one. All right. Here we go. Let's say that I had a rich uncle. We'll call him Uncle Phineas. All right? The return of Uncle Phineas. <laughs> uncle Phineas. <laughs> I'm still waiting for this rich uncle to manifest. Okay? Well, let's say this. Let's say one day Uncle Phineas calls me up, and he says, Jason, I have just deposited $100,000 into account into an account with your name on it. But you've got to go to a certain bank in Oklahoma to receive it and to withdraw those funds. Now, I acknowledge what my uncle is communicating to me, and I believe that his word is trustworthy, so I begin to act on what he has told me. I get online, and I book a flight to Oklahoma. I book a hotel, and I even book a shuttle to get myself to the airport. I just make all the necessary travel arrangements. I get to the airport, I get through TSA, that's always fun, right? And then I board the plane. And now as I'm flying to Oklahoma, I'm thinking to myself, I hope my uncle sees all this. I'm really believing his word. I'm really acting on it. I sure hope that he sees all this and that he's pleased with it and that he releases those funds into my account by the time I arrive at the bank. Okay. Now I get to my hotel room in Oklahoma, and I check in for the night. I know that tomorrow morning I'm going to be at the bank as soon as those doors open. But you know what? I'm tossing and turning in my bed all night long, thinking to myself, oh, I hope my uncle sees all this. I hope my uncle sees that I booked my flight, booked the hotel, got myself out here, all because I believe him. I hope that it pleases him and that by 9 a.m. tomorrow, when I go to the bank, I hope that he, being fully pleased with my actions, will release that money into my account. I sure hope so. Okay? So that's scenario number one. Now keep that in your mind. Here's scenario number two, just like scenario number one. My Uncle Phineas calls me up, tells me he's placed $100,000 uh, into an account with my name on it, and tells me that I've got to go to this bank in Oklahoma to retrieve the money. I believe his word, so I book my flight, hotel, and transportation. Well, watch this now. Now... As I'm on the plane, I'm completely reclined in my seat with a big smile on my face. And I'm thinking to myself, woo-wee, I'm $100,000 richer. I wonder what I'm going to buy Alicia, right? You know, while I've got this time on the plane, maybe I should look up some, yeah, right? While i got this time on the plane, maybe I should look up some vacation destinations. You know what? I think it's time for a new car, too. Thank you, Uncle Phineas. Hallelujah, right? I go to the hotel, and I sleep like a baby, knowing that the $100,000 is mine. Now, I haven't yet seen it with my eyes. I haven't yet physically retrieved the money because the bank doesn't open until the morning. But I'm totally ecstatic and confident in my uncle's word. The money is as real to me as if it was in my physical possession because I'm operating out of a past tense faith that my uncle has released those funds and that he did in, indeed put $100,000 into an account with my name on it. So in my mind and heart, I'm in a place of total rest. I'm $100,000 richer, okay? So friends, that's what faith looks like. That's the difference between hope and faith, okay? 
That's how faith operates. We don't hope that God is going to come through. We don't try to inspire him with our actions and our words to do something for us that he hasn't already done. All of our actions, all of our words are coming from a place of response to the truth that God has already met our need. Now, notice in both of those scenarios that I mentioned, the actions were identical, right? Going to the, uh, at the airport, booking the hotel, booking the flight, doing all those things. Actions were absolutely identical. But what was actually being believed in those two scenarios was very different. One was demonstrating a position of hope, looking to what was going to happen, looking forward, right? The other was demonstrating a position of faith, looking to what has already happened, okay? So in closing, uh, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. The only logical way to understand this verse is to understand that he's saying that we have to put uh, our answer to prayer in the past tense and regard it from that moment on as an accomplished reality by faith. That's the only way that verse makes sense. In other words, let's think about it practically for a minute. If you plug healing in there, right? And, you know, the word says, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. What does that mean for healing? That means when I say amen, it's settled. I'm regarding myself as healed. I'm not going to keep seeking God to heal me. No, from that moment on, I'm acknowledging the truth of the word of God that he has healed me. I believe I have received. And then I live my life as such. That's Mark eleven twenty four. Okay? That's how we receive from God. That's how we see our victory. Right? What's that song? I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Well, how do we see a victory? We see, a, we see the victory by faith. So, guys, I, uh, I just want to inspire you tonight to put your miracle, to put your healing, to put your deliverance in the past tense. Uh, just like Jonah did. Just like Abraham did, okay? Just like uh, it's telling us here in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. That's exactly what he's telling us to do. Put it in the past tense. If you take that step to put the answer, okay, to your need in the past tense, you will see a manifestation. That, that's the only condition regarding what the Lord promises us, a manifestation. He didn't say, you know, whatever things you ask when you pray, you just keep bombarding heaven again and again and again and again and keep begging for it. Now, he said, you believe that you receive when? When you pray. When you pray. And then you walk on. So we have to get on God's wavelength and take him at his word. And then you know what? Then we'll see our breakthrough. First, you see it with your heart. And then you'll see it with your eyes. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you know what I like to do? I like to play. Uh, I think we have some time. I like to play a little testimony um, about a lady who put a lot of these things that I'm talking about. Uh, she actually put her healing in the past tense. Uh, Falco, do you have that, buddy? Yes? Okay. Good deal. So this is going to incorporate a lot of the concepts that we're talking about tonight. Praise God. Aren't we excited I to be having a funeral, of okay, the, thoughts of, <laughs> of my, the thoughts of more or less my kids not growing up not knowing who I was was the hardest thing for me to deal with. You know, I was thinking what I was going to do because they told Wendy, they told all of us, you know, estimate two to five years she had left to live. Wendy and Steve Moore were living out their dreams. They both had exciting careers. Steve as a sheriff's deputy and Wendy as a 911 operator and an emergency medical technician. Their young family was growing as they celebrated the birth of their youngest son, Zachary. What started off as a strange weakness in Wendy's legs was eventually diagnosed as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It destroys motor nerves and leaves the body in a state of paralysis. No one survives this deadly disease. Wendy and Steve's dreams for the future quickly turned into a nightmare. When I read the literature on it and, and you know, you, you suffocate to death, I mean, that's how you die. It's a horrible, horrible death. And I didn't want to have to go through that with my active life, you know, that I thought, you know, I. I, I take care of other people. That's my job. You know, it's, it's not somebody's job to take care of me. It was probably like a, a living funeral. I mean, every time we tried to put it aside, 
somebody else either called, stopped by, and we can never just put it behind us. Wendy's parents remember their shock after hearing the diagnosis. Well, I knew exactly what ALS was when they gave us that diagnosis. However, I was numb to what they were saying. I've got a cousin whose wife died of ALS, and uh, it was horrific. She just said, Mom, I don't know if we're going to have, if I'm going to see Jake go to school, if I'm going to see Zachy graduate. You know, those were all things that were in her mind, and naturally she'd share with us, and then that would bring on more tears, you know. Wendy's Aunt Jan knew the only hope for the family was the power of God's Word. She suggested a class on healing. Well, I called my brother and I told him, I said, you, ha you have to go to these classes. I said, Wendy will be healed. It's here at Dayspring Ministries that Wendy and her family learned the healing promises of the Bible. It gave them the strength to press on. I learned things like, you know, God's Word is life to those who find it, health out of their flesh. So it starts to make you feel like, you know what, this is the stuff that's going to make me live. You know, I threw all the other things away, threw it in the trash. That wasn't what I needed to hear. They had told me what they told me. Now I was taking a different approach. So all the pamphlets, all the information Everything. on Luke Garrett. I threw it away. You tossed it. Tossed it. <laughs> and in their place, Bible verses everywhere. We had scriptures posted all over the, our house, and that, I had to take my, that was my daily dose of medication. Um, scripture. The scripture. Wendy's mother also knew they were going to need the support of other believers to fight this battle. I called 700 Club. I called several of the ministries. I, we had relatives all over the United States and, and sent emails to all over the United States and asked them to pray with us and believe that Wendy would be healed. And what did you think when you would hear these reports from the doctors that, yes, you still have Luke Gehrig, um, it's still progressing or you're maintaining it? What was going through your mind? You know, my aunt always told me, you know, we can't be moved by what they say. You know, we're, you can listen to what they say, but you can't be moved by that. You have to be moved with what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says, by His stripes you were healed. Wendy and her family pressed on. They tried to live a normal life and believed that God was going to heal her. Wendy even decided to go back to her job as a 911 operator. I began to see um, improvements because I wasn't falling as often. Um, my muscles would twitch, you know, I'd have muscle twitches and it, they weren't twitching quite as often anymore, but really what I noticed the most is the, the, um, the falling. I, I wasn't tripping as much as what I normally did, so th that's when I really started to notice some physical, you know, manifestations. Wendy's doctors at the University of Michigan couldn't understand why her condition wasn't getting worse, so they asked her to go through more testing. We walked in the room and Wendy was sobbing. She was literally sobbing. Her head was in her hands and she was sobbing. And I asked her, I said, what's wrong? And she looked up and was crying and she says, I no longer have ALS. And that's exactly what we had been praying for. And what did the doctors say? What was their explanation? Um, they said that, um, that there was no nerve death. They, see, they had seen some nerve damage. So there was evidence that there was something that had gone on. The final doctor's report declared Wendy Moore free of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. It's just, it's just an awesome, overwhelming feeling to have been told that, you know, someday you're going to die. And now for the doctors to say, this is gone, you know, and yet I knew in my spirit the whole time that's what, that's, that would be the outcome. Wendy's aunt knows that God listens and answers the prayers of believers. I just see how much he loved us what he died on the cross and he took our sicknesses and our diseases and I'm just so thankful that he he is God today Wendy and Steve are enjoying the life they thought they'd never have they are once again dreaming of a future filled with the hope that Jesus Christ gives them now it, it's, a, it's a family again I mean it's not just me with the kids it's all of us I, every day, it has, you know, you wake, I wake up and I thank God for today. I'm almost thankful that I've gone through what I've gone through because I may, have not, I may not be where I'm at today. Being able to tell you and being able to tell the whole world um, that God's healing power is still for today. You know, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. As many times as I've seen that, it, it, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love to watch stories like that because, you know, 
Jesus is so real. These are real people with real problems. This was an absolute nightmare in this woman's life. She needed a solution that only the Lord could give. And praise God, we have a healing Jesus. He's the same Jesus that he always was, the same Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee 2,000 years ago, giving sight to the blind, giving deaf, um, giving hearing to the deaf, okay? He's the same Jesus. Praise God. But uh, I wanted you to notice that she, she, there's a line there. She said, um, you know, she stopped looking at all the medical literature, okay? And she kind of threw that all out and would acknowledge what that said. But she acknowledged the word of God, which said, by whose stripes you were healed, okay? And so that's how this woman lived her life, and it was for a prolonged period. It wasn't instantaneous. I'll tell you a little uh, story about this testimony here. There was a lady, uh, and she's a great Christian author. Her name's Melanie Henry, okay? And she writes for uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. She's an excellent writer. Well, she wrote a book a few years back um, detailing a lot of these healing testimonies, okay? And she did a segment on this lady in her book. Okay, she did a profile on this lady and on her story. And um, I actually spoke to the writer. And I talked for a, a good hour and a half, and she gave me some of the, the background information on a lot of these people, right? Well, uh, you find out by reading that book that it's a little bit more involved than even what you see in this testimony, obviously. I mean, and this is over a number of, of a couple years, right? And what it says in the book, and I just love this, this is awesome, that as this lady, after she believed that God had healed her and started walking that out, okay, do you think the symptoms went away immediately? Not at all. The symptoms stayed just as bad, if not worse, okay? But she said that she would trip, she would fall, she would fall flat on her face, and then with gritted teeth, she would say, by his stripes, I am healed. And she would push herself up off the ground, giving praise to God for the truth according to his word that he had, past tense, healed her. And sure enough, her healing manifested. Okay? I know that this can be a, a change for a lot of us, right? Because, you know, we're so used to, how do we determine whether we're, we're sick or well? By looking at our physical bodies, right? From the time we're little. If we don't feel good, well, we're sick, right? So we're just conditioned to, to uh, let our physical bodies be the evidence as to whether we're well or not. We need a change. We need to let the word of God define truth for our lives, just like this woman did. She lost sight of what her physical body was telling her. She lost sight of what the doctors were telling her. And she focused, just with laser beam-like focus, on what the word of God said, by whose stripes you were healed. So uh, this will work for anything, not just physical healing. It will work for emotional healing. It will work for deliverance. It will work for provision. Anything you need from God, you get it by faith. And we have to be clear on what faith is. Faith is me taking the answer. Faith is me taking the word of God and putting it in the past tense, okay? And walking out on that in total peace, in total confidence. Hallelujah. My needs are met. My body is healed. I am delivered. Just like Jonah did in the belly of that whale. In the middle of the problem, started praising God. I thank you, Lord, you have heard me, and I'm delivered. Hallelujah. It's the same today. Praise Jesus. Well, I think we have time for a couple of questions. If anybody has questions, Ms. Pat. Um, I'm so grateful for, for tonight's teaching, and I learned a lot from it. And the one thing I've learned is I've been living in, um, in hope for salvation for family members and, you know, and not, I guess, bringing my faith into it. And I, I just want to be clear about being... Um, properly, you know, in, you know, in the right place, you know, doing it the right way um, for salvation, because for the family members that I'm, you know, praying about, because uh, it's a rough group, you know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, family members are usually the, the roughest folks in the world to even talk to about salvation and whatnot, because they know you, they, they, I knew you when, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards, and yet, you want desperately for them to, to be saved, so, um, I guess my question is about positioning when you're praying for other folks, and not for yourself. Right, right, well, that's a really, really good question, and, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, when it comes to other people, there is their will that is involved, and so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to receive, um, like, something like, 
you know, um, salvation for somebody else, you know what I mean, uh, by proxy. Uh, so, you know, but we, we, you know, that's what I was talking about tonight. Hope does have its place, you know, and Jesus is our blessed hope. So what you can do is this. You can speak the word of God. You can push back the forces of darkness that would try to control their minds, try to influence them. Okay, you can take your authority, okay, as a, uh, a born-again child of God in the name of Jesus, and you can kind of clear the path, so to speak, spiritually, okay? And that will, that will have a, a great effect because a lot of uh, unsaved people, you know, they're getting a lot of influence on a spiritual level. Do you see what I'm saying? And they need a born-again believer to take their authority and push back that darkness, okay? But we don't keep hoping, we don't keep praying, we don't keep speaking, and most importantly, we don't stop preaching to them, okay? Because how do we get saved? We get saved by the word. You know what I mean? Nobody really prayed me into the kingdom of God, okay? It was the word of God, right? I mean, I don't want to, you know, you guys can misunderstand me. Of course, people were praying, and that's, that has its role. But it's the word of God. We give people the word of God. The word of God will, will do its job, that incorruptible seed. That's a great question, Pat. And I like how you, you know, are distinguishing there between faith and hope. That's awesome. Praise God. Stephen? Uh, as you were speaking, this is what I thought of. One verse in the Bible, <clears throat> Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's like those stories you were telling. The verses they have, that's how you increase your faith. So. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's why we're doing it. You know? And that's why I listen to you guys at the end of the teaching. A relevant testimony. So that you understand that it's not just theory. It's not just this you know, guy getting up here and you know, playing like a philosophy. No, it, you know, it's the word of God. I was having a conversation with the Lord uh, over the past couple days. And I just told him, Lord, you know, if it's not your message, if it's not your word, I don't want, I don't want to have anything to do with it, right? Put your word in my mouth. Put your word in my heart. That's what I want to preach. Amen. Praise God. Mark? I got to listen to it, but um, I also thought about, like, uh, family members that were praying for salvation. And as you were talking about, I was, say, I was thinking how, like, some of my church family, I can go to them and say, like, hey, God did this for me the other day, or, or share them testimonies. And, and if I were to act like they're already believers, I might bring some of that stuff more out of their testimonies and, or, or just um, what's going on, you know what I mean, or this or that, you know what I mean? It might be, it might be a part of it, too, you know what I mean, acting as if they're already story of a lady who um, wanted to marry Kenneth Copeland. Okay, this is a true story. And so she, Kenneth Copeland was obviously already married to Gloria Copeland. And so this lady, this is a completely crazy story, but she had a wedding in the spirit, so to speak, okay, where she claimed Mark 11, 24, that she was marrying Kenneth Copeland and then was commanding Gloria to die. Okay, I mean, really, just really nuts. You know, here's the thing. If it's not in the word of God, it's not ours, Okay. You know, we only believe for the things that Jesus has provided for us. Salvation, healing, deliverance, the blessing of Abraham. These things are ours. But uh, what does the Bible say? We don't, you know, receive things from God so that we can use them for our own selfish pleasures, right? So there's a difference there. We have to be, and I like that you brought up that point, we have to be making sure that we're walking in lockstep with the Spirit of God. And we know that we are by looking at the Word of God, right? So I don't have to wonder, hmm, does God want to heal me? I just crack open the Bible, I look at the Gospels, and I see on almost every page the heart of God pouring out, okay, in compassion towards the sick or to the lost, whatever. So that's a great point, Mark. Put yourself in position, like you said in the beginning, you've got to put yourself in position throughout the Bible. 
but also it is like uh, you said that there was like uh, leave it, there was, like there was nothing left to do, like uh, but also like like I remember Pastor teaching on the lady going to the judge over and over and over again. He got sick and tired of it. So finally he granted her request. Right, right. So you you can't just um can't always just like believe in, don't worry about it anymore. Maybe as far as some healing, you know what I mean? Right. As far as healing. And um I believe like uh, it mm -hmm. matters like like how you're treating your body and what you're doing in life mm -hmm. and how you're treating your temple as well. Right. You know what I mean? Well you know I can give you some thoughts. thoughts. There's so much about on the words that God gave herbs for, for uh, healing and stuff like that. Right. Well, I'll give you some food for thought on that. Okay, the, the, yeah. the, uh, I'll just judge, right? uh, you know, that attitude of tenacity, that is an expression of faith. And when you truly believe something, you're going to have tenacity like that woman did. But uh, let's bear this in mind. You know, the purpose of that parable was uh, for comparison. So Jesus wasn't saying that his father was like this wicked, uh, insensitive, unjust judge, okay? He was saying on the contrary, you know, his father's full of compassion, his father's full of mercy. So you, if you would approach that judge with that level of tenacity and determination, okay, and a willingness to uh, get a uh, uh, restoration, how much more so should you approach, you know, God who just loves us, whose heart is just pouring out to meet our needs, right? Jesus said that uh, the father knows the things that we have need of before we ask him, okay? Does that mean he's just aware? No, that means he wants to meet those needs. He knows our needs. He's eager to meet those needs, but he needs faith in order for his power to flow. Okay? Praise God. Anybody else? We got like, well, probably not. <laughs> okay. If you do, bring it back next week because, uh, all right, Al, go ahead. God's safety and protection. Uh, my van was making some noise, and your van had the barriers in it. Something with the barrier because it always made that noise when the barrier went back. So I drove from here to Murraysville, dropped something off. The next day I took my friend over to meet his son over there, dropped the computer off, come back. So Monday I, I seen the seen the mechanic and he, I said, What's this making all this noise? He said, ah, it's a barrier. So don't worry about it. He said, just go get another barrier. So when I went to go around the corner for the mechanics, it really made a lot of noise. I just left it there. Walked up, walked up. Next day, got a bear, walked down, gave him a bear. Went, grass cut with my friend. He called me up, he says, uh, you only had one blood nut stud on the left. He says, the other one was gone. He handed me like three that were broken off already. So I may have two, but could have come off and killed us. Wow. You know, but praise this guy. Just, he gives his angels charge for us. So, praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Al. That was, that was awesome. Jonah and the well, like, uh, I wonder if he was just sitting there, like, uh, quiet, and, you know what I mean? And then, like, all of a sudden he starts, like, scream, screaming what he believes and this and that, and the well's like, oh, maybe that was a human. You know what I mean? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. It's, it's a wild story. It's a wild story. You know what I mean? It's amazing. They are absolute truth. Jesus even referenced that story, okay, when he talked about his resurrection. I mean, praise God, these things really happen, and, and they're in the Word of God for us to learn from them, okay, to, to uh, gain knowledge and lessons and things that we can apply to our lives today. Well, praise God. It's 815, so I'm going to pray. This is a great night. Praise God. Lord Jesus, Lord, we just praise you tonight. I just thank you, Lord, for all these precious people, Lord, these precious souls, Lord, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are teaching us to walk in faith. You're teaching us how to respond to your Word, and we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have already met our needs, Lord. It's in the past tense, Lord Jesus. We're not, we're not uh, waiting for you. You're just waiting for us to cooperate and take your word at face value. Jesus, we praise you. We thank you, Father. We just thank you, Father, for sending your son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. We thank you for your blood that was shed for us, for your body that was broken for us. You've done it all, Lord. And we just glorify you and honor you and believe you tonight. And I just bless all these people, Lord. Give your angels charge over them on the roads. Bless and protect and keep them in all their ways. And bring us back on Sunday where we'll worship, worship you and praise your name. And all the people said in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.